overall uh, floor plan. As you can see, it, it is similar in um, floor plan to Millbrook. But we wanted to work on what I was calling more of, of an activity axis. So north and south, you, you have your gym, your stage, your cafeteria commons. Then you'll see here a learning stair come into, into the concept. Behind that is our um, learning commons or media center. And as you move into the classroom wings, you have open activity spaces for the classrooms to, to come into and, and utilize. We just want to make sure that we're have engaging spaces throughout the building as the students travel around. This is just a blow up of the what we're calling the um, at the athletic or activity area of the building. Uh, one thing I do want to make note is we um, our main entrance is similar to all of our other facilities with this secure entrance. We spent a lot of time talking about um, also how staff can co can co collaborate in this facility as well. So we wanted to pay special attention to to their break room, their work room areas. Um, and then also want to make note that the, the gym is also going to be our storm shelter for the facility. It'll be made of pre precast. It's a, it's a larger uh, space that's usually open, and we can get a, a lot, lot of people into that space. Uh, so that's our designated storm shelter area. One of the um, classroom wings, as we move uh, around the building, wanted to make note of the small group areas that are outside of the classroom space. Our design concepts is to have a little bit more transparency between the actual classroom space and the activity outboard. We want to make sure that if the kids need to be um, or the kids want to go out and do um, small group learning, we can create the environment for them. We also created these smaller, what we're calling co-lab spaces that you can see in yellow. Uh, another small spot for, for the kids to go in for, for groups of, of six to eight. and but not be in the activity area and more of a, a smaller quiet space. Also, the, the big yellow uh, box is, is the art room. What we did is we, we brought the art room outboard, and as soon as you walk into the facility, you're going to see this, this nice, bright art room. Um, we, we feel it's good for um, people that are visiting the building to be able to see the kids in their artwork and watch them do pottery and drawing. So you'll be able to see that as soon as you walk into to the facility. The upper pot area is designated for our kindergarten and first grade. Um, one of the new concepts that, that we had on this um, plan is to allow the kindergarten and first grade to have their own single restrooms. What we want is a more flexibility of space in this wing. So if we fluctuate between pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade, we can swap rooms and be interchangeable. Sometimes we design kindergarten classrooms that are specific for kindergarten. This way, this whole entire wing could fluctuate for however the, the need is for the building at the time. And then the, um, the third pot area, and we're starting to show a little bit of the learning commons. You can see the circular learning stairs that is um, at the, the bottom left hand. And then we go into what we're calling our learning commons or media center. What we did is we reduced the number of corridor space in this building. So we wanted to kind of start to give that back to the building and more program space. So when you see the interior renderings of the Learning Commons Media Center moving forward, it's more open. It's, it's not boxed in with, with four walls. I uh, also want to make mention uh, of the other bigger yellow box in there. That, that's a designated makerspace classroom for, for the facility as well. And we'll show you a rendering of what that's going to look like. Uh, open ceiling environment, concrete floor. Um, we'll, we'll put a, a Lego wall up so, so the kids can get really creative in that space as well. But I do want to make mention that the smaller yellow boxes also is more of our um, um, special services, and we move those to the core of the classroom. Once again, didn't want kids traveling very far in this facility. If you come to the heart of the building, that's where um, you'll, you'll find your media center and, and your um, SPED and Quest and um, PTOT and classrooms as well. So then we start to talk about exterior concepts. We, we work vertically in, in boxes, and we start to, to bring in um, con contextual elements of what the elevations are going to look like, a lot of sketches during this time. Uh, we start to look at what the building's going to look like as a whole. Um, we wanted to start to, to have it bring in a lot of the similar context for the neighborhood that is sub surrounding. So you'll start to see a lot of uh, earth tone colors, uh, buff brick with some some vertical accents that are a little bit darker. Uh, we do have some some precast, and then also uh, we'll have metal panels that will have a, a copper or patina look, and some more stone 
um, since we're going into the Canyon Creek High Highland area, kind of um, working off of St. James Academy that's out there as well. Just a reminder, our site is north of K-10, west of K-7, at the very northwest corner of our district in the Canyon Creek Highland subdivision, uh, just a little bit to the southeast of St. St. James Academy. Our site plan, we're or orienting the building so that our front door faces the, the neighborhood. Once again, same concept of, of um, two parking areas. The one to the north will be our bus and visitor and, and um, a small uh, number of staff parking. Two to the south will be um, parent and parent pick up and drop off. Um, once again, utilizing the playground area for that so we can stack as much cars uh, under our property as possible and get them off the main street. The city of Lenox requirement. The building elevations, once again, you can start to see more of the uh, earth tone palette uh, that we're um, using. The main admin box will have the, the composite metal panels that will be the copper and patina look. So it kind of draws your eye to the to the front of the building. The gym will be made of precast with a, a darker metal panel um, on top of it, and then of course the the light water table, and then the rest of the facility will be will be of brick. So this is a little a rendering that. So we took the same sketch concepts as we we showed you earlier and implemented that to to the final product. Um, this is a rendering looking northeast. So what you see at the the very center is the the main entrance to the to the facility. Just another view of the, the main entrance, and you can start to see the, the copper patina look of the metal panels of the front entry. Large canopy, uh, so we can uh, shelter everybody when they come in and out of the facility. Another rendering of the gym, gymnasium space. Um, one of the uh, design features, we have a, a canopy system that wraps all the way around that gym, because this, this will be where the kids uh, exit the building for um, parent pickup. We want to make sure that in case it's raining, we, we protect the kids from the elements. And then a rendering of the classroom wings. So the activity spaces outside of the classroom wings, you can start to see they'll, they'll have more uh, glazing and openness, nice and bright. Here's a rendering for cafeteria and stage. So you can um, see the, the stage, how it relates to the uh, cafeteria area. One of the big um, um, design features as well is in previous models, the cafeteria space um, is just used for cafeteria. So the rest of the day, it doesn't really get used. We wanted to bring that outboard and, and try to see if we can make this space more inviting for, for students and staff to use throughout the day. Then opposite of the stages is the learning stair for performances. As soon as you walk in the building, I made mention earlier, you'll be able to see art. So you can see how nice and bright and open it is. We've got student bench seating in front um, so everybody can, can see what's happening in, in our art classrooms. Rendering of our classroom activity wing areas. Uh, you can see the, the smaller uh, um, glass boxes. Those are the, the collaboration areas, small group areas for, for kids to go in and, and do a myriad of, of projects or any um, or um, any sort of small group teaching. Rendering of the learning commons, as mentioned before, we, we took the, the corridor aspect out of it, made the learning commons more open, bright, because um, it's going to be a main tra transition area be between all parts of the building. The circular wall that you see on the back side or at the far is the back side of the learning stairs. It gives us an opportunity to create little seating nooks for, for kids to take books into, soft padded seating, a, a smaller stage area uh, in case they ever want to do uh, um, little pre presentations in the Learning Commons Media Center area. And then finally, just a, a rendering of the makerspace block, wood, wood block tables. Uh, metal seats, concrete floor, a place where, where kids can um, really explore them themselves uh, for all the projects that can happen in that space as well. Thank you. Thank if you. you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Any questions from the board? How big is this one compared to others that we've recently done? So uh, Mill, Millbrook is about 79,000 square feet, and this is 74,000. So we got really efficient with our corridor spaces to turn them into program space. So we actually dropped the, the square footage. And I know we've done flexible seating <coughs> at West and at Mill Creek. 
will we continue that here in the classroom? We're studying that right now. Okay. Um, that's one of the things where our committee is going to have to help give us a lot of input as well, yeah. because as, as we've toured around, we've seen lots of different things in different schools. And as you tour around our district, you see lots of different things yeah. as well. And so um, one of the things that we know for sure is that this school will probably not have independent student desks. We know we're probably looking at tables, but also some other soft seating working areas within classrooms as well. Thank you. Great question. Doug, you put that in mind and love all the open space and all of this and it, it, specifically in the high school the kids are a little bit more self-directed in elementary school sometimes they need a little more direction kind of talk through that I, i'm assuming we had that discussion we thought about that and said okay if it if it's too wide open how do we make sure we keep them directed and, and maybe a little bit more a little bit more contained in some cases. Well, I would tell you that's something that surprised us on our visits, honestly, is if elementary kids know the procedures and routines and kind of the parameters, they probably need less less direction than we think in terms of where to be and things. And, and that was a little bit of a surprise as we did some of our tours and saw schools with kids. And we're like, how do they know that they're not supposed to go there, but they're supposed to go there? So that was kind of an eye opener for us. But one of the things that lends itself really nicely is just the different wings of the building. So, you know, like the kindergarten and first graders will be together. The teachers will all have pretty open classrooms to the pod area, to also the collaboration spaces in each one of the wings. So everyone will have eyes kind of on what kids are doing and where they're going and things like that um, also if you look at then it's kind of hard to see on the gray one oh, but okay. the collaboration spaces the the yellow ones are kind of the glassed in collaboration collaboration spaces that's where we really see kids maybe working into independently without an adult kind of right with them and those kinds of things but again an eye shot of classrooms and what's going on as well so, but it'll definitely take some uh, procedure routine practice and all those kinds of things as the school year gets started so kids stay in their area with kids but also with staff as well because everybody's going to have to be on board it's a good question other questions one of the things too that we didn't mention that's pretty cool about this building is the the learning commons area kind of that salmon area in the middle um, all of the library furniture that we're picturing for this, so, so the stacks of books, things like that, it will all be on wheels because one of the things that we're hoping in this school is that we'll have some distributed library resources for kids that rather than kids just going there all the time, that if kids are studying, studying the white water cycle, the librarian might put all the books about water cycle on one cart, haul that down to the second grade pod, um, and the kids can interact with it that way and just have it be more fluid and flexible throughout the building. Very good. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate thank it. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that, uh, go ahead and feel free to, to ask those. If not, I would seek a motion to approve. I'd actually like to get a little information on 5.09. Talk a little bit about the uh, mathematics standards revisions and updates. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, Rick and I had a brief discussion yesterday. He asked me a few questions from our report, and I was thrilled to have the opportunity to come up and visit with you for a few minutes. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bridget Stevens. She's our math uh, curriculum coordinator for the district, so she's going to help me out tonight. And Rich Wilson was very sad he couldn't be here. Rich Wilson is our assessment director. Um, he currently had a position like Bridget in the past. So Shannon, kind of like you, he told me not to break this tonight, right? <laughs> so I'm your ELA perspective, and Rich brings the math with Bridget, and so I'm going to try really hard not to break that. So with this, we have for you um, last month and then this month some standards that we're asking you to approve. And as Rick and I visited, we thought it might be nice just to get a little overview about how this works. Um, I know sometimes you're asked questions, and there are a lot of questions about math. Parents all want their students to be prepared in math. And so we thought it'd be great just to take a few minutes and visit about this. So as you see this, we, you know, we're, we're tapping into the industry, tapping into the college and career readiness. What do we want to have students prepared for? So you look through that, the ability to reason, to problem solve, to work collaboratively, um, to have those 21st century skills, to think in a logical <clears throat> way. All of those things we think about as we write curriculum and we look at standards. So we, we, we keep these things in mind at the state level and then at the local level when we're looking at standard provisions. Um, typically, the state um, has, an, has an overview of about every seven years they look at standards. 
Um, the great thing about this is that they, again, tap into industry. They tap into educators, Kansas educators. Um, Olathe has a very nice representation at the state level. We actually have two people who sit on that committee. So Rich Wilson sits on that committee. And then we also have an Olathe Northwest teacher, Chris Bishop, who sits on that committee. So we're really excited to have a presence at the state level. Um, one of the things that's crucial that I love that Kansas does is that we want to kind of have this guidance with standards. So it doesn't matter what zip code a student lives in in the state of Kansas, we have guiding principles or those standards, right? And even for us, 51, 52 schools, we have kids that move from school to school in the district. But if you think about that at the state level and then even at the national level, it's nice to have that guide. So if I'm in second grade and my family gets transferred across the country, I'm not going to miss something. I will be prepared for third grade. So we call those progressions. So we have this guidance that the state helps us write and they sort of help us identify the what and then we really delve into the how we're gonna teach that. So that's the way that that works. Um, at the state level. So from, um, we're asking you to look at the 2017 um, pieces, but I want to talk to you, and Bridget's going to go into a little bit more detail about what's changed between 2010 and then what we're asking um, our district to, to go ahead and approve the 2017 version. One of the things that really changed in 2010 is that as the state and even at, at, the, at the federal level, looking at standards, we realized kids need to go deeper. So one of the things we're really proud of in 2010 is that we went from a bunch of standards into fewer standards, but really wanting to go deep with those. So when you think of that depth of knowledge, we wanted kids to go deep, really grapple, and get to that level four where, where they were doing what we like to call the heavy lifting. So great changes took place in that. The other thing that took place in 2010 was really fine-tuning what I'm going to call that vertical alignment. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, again, you'll hear that word progressions a lot, that what's going on in kindergarten, we're scaffolding for first grade and second grade, but that we don't spend a semester in third grade learning what we did in second grade because we have new content that we have to cover. So these were really great gains that happened in the 2010 adoption. So we blink and it's now 2017. Teachers have been teaching these standards for seven years. And so this is what Bridget's going to talk to you a little bit about are one of those things that were really great from the 2010 adoption. And over those past seven years, what have the educators, the teachers that are in the classrooms, learned about what they want to tweak? So you'll see um, sometimes we tweak standards a little bit and they move from one grade level to another. Um, one of the things we realized from 2010 to 2017 is the assessment piece. And these need to align with the Kansas um, the Kansas assessment, and we felt like there were some places that really needed to be tweaked. So we're just going to talk a little bit more about that. And then there are some places we realized that we, we needed to drop some standards. So these were really tweaked from the work that happened in 2010. Um, and so we're just going to take a few minutes and go into a little bit more depth for you with that. Mm -hmm. The state has provided us with a three-year implementation timeline. Right now, currently this year, we're in the zero year where we have an opportunity to get to know those standards and make comparisons between the old standards and the new ones. Teachers will begin to implement those standards in the fall of 2018, and then we'll see the state assessment change to match those standards in year 2019-2020. Our teachers this year have been taking a look at the standards, uh, identifying what is new, what has changed. Um, we are taking a look at writing student learning targets so that we know and understand our standards very well and we can speak to what we want our students to know and to be able to do. Uh, we've been tweaking our resources as well, lesson plans, pacing guides, uh, that type of thing. And then certainly we'll be looking at making changes to our assessments uh, so that we can follow that assessment data and ensure that we're on the right track with students. The state provided us with a comparison document that's been really great, helpful for the teachers. I can tell you that the teachers are very excited about the changes that have been made in the standards across lots of different grades. Um, this is just a table that gives you an idea of some of the changes were small, slight, just words here or there were changed for clarity. Um, new standards were possibly added in, one that the um, teachers in the state felt needed to be in addition to into the standards and then just how they've broken them apart a little bit as well. 
The high school saw a significant change in terms of their content standards. Uh, the standards from 2010 were are written pretty broad, where you could read a particular standard and interpret, try to interpret what parts of that standard lives in Algebra 1, what part of that standard lives in Algebra 2, and college algebra. And at that time, we were really aiming and trying to sort of guess to see where we'd really put that content. This uh, go around, they went ahead and they broke those apart and said this component or this part of a particular standard is what we want in Algebra 1. And then we get a little bit more depth and we add that component into Algebra 2 and then higher up through um, the grades and through the courses. So the teachers are very pleased with that. They feel um, they have a better idea of what that uh, Kansas assessment will look like you know, for, for 10th graders. Um, and they're pleased with the changes that have been made. questions that we can answer for you? Yes. Hi, I have a question. Um, you talked a lot about the work that teachers are doing to get ready for this. Can you help us to understand what that looks like? Are teachers meeting in their buildings? Are we doing district-wide initiatives? You know, how are we making sure that our staff, like, like every single teacher, understands how things are going to change? This is a lot of the work that Dr. Stevens does, so I'm going to let you go ahead and answer that in a little more detail. Sure. So we have some district-level uh, professional development days um, where we work together um, as a building or possibly in bigger groups. Um, this year, the teachers at the elementary level were writing student learning targets with one another. They were back in their building and submitting those through a Google document so that we could gather what they've written, um, bring them in and use those to help us re revise our curriculum. Uh, we also just have in our typical PLC time within a building where teachers get together to continue that same type of work, updating their lesson plans, updating um, their pacing guide, that type of thing. Um, second grade was in on Monday to work with me all day. So we did some major changes there. Um, and then even today, eighth grade math was in today to make some changes. So it happens across the district, within the buildings, but then also coming here uh, at a central location too. And I would say another layer is that this is when we have a great partnership with our friends in general administration, so Dr. Yeager and Dr. McMullen, and we spend time and we update the principals as well um, because they're the layer that see teachers and students all the time, so we want them to be prepared in this work. Um, and so that's some other work that we do. We'll push into principal meetings, spend time with their professional learning so they have a better handle on what this means at the building level as well. And then are we going to have to make changes to our resources, textbooks, things like that? It's a great question. We'll have some slight changes that we'll need to make. Um, a particular fourth grade uh, standard actually moved to eighth grade, and our eighth grade curriculum doesn't have it. So we're pulling resources to make sure that what we put in is coherent, timely, fits in with the other um, curriculum that we have, so it develops, it's developmentally appropriate <coughs> for the students. So you also saw in there we look at about a seven-year cycle. And so we always follow up and try to align our resource adoption after we have adopted new curriculum. So that's hopefully on a seven-year cycle as well. So we never want to purchase resources before we adopt a new curriculum, but then after we're ready. So we have textbooks on those cycles as well to respond to some of those things you know, that are needed. Thank you. Well, Dr. Dean, you're talking about that cycle. So is, is that what it's been? It's about every seven years mm -hmm. we get some updates? Yes. Okay. Is there like a catch up for any when you implement this with grades that kind of get caught up? You mentioned something from the fourth day. Is there a sure. plan for that? Uh, so next school year, in year one, those uh, standards that move like from fourth grade to eighth grade will be implemented next year in year one. Uh, they won't see any changes on the state assessment. They give us that year grace period to get to know the standard, do some assessments, do some revision of them. And then in 1920, that's when we'll see the first assessment um, where eighth grade has to be assessed on those angles that moved up from fourth grade. So that's kind of the ramp up that we get to plan. And then when we bring teachers in, that's part of the work that we look at as well. So we may see some kids where there are some standards that they may there may be gaps. We need to do, do more pre-teaching, reteaching. How are we going to handle that? And so that's part of the work that Dr. Stevens does in guiding them as well so that we use that ramp up time to be prepared for when we actually do have that state assessment that aligns with those standards. Okay. Other questions? Right. 
Thank you. Well, Heather, thanks for much. having Appreciate us. It. We're excited to be Thank here you. tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much. Board, any other items you'd like to pull off for discussion? I move to approve consent agenda items numbered 5.01 to 5.13 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Martin, second by Mr. Geary. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Geary? Yes. Mr. Wycliffe? Yes. All right. Uh, other action items? Uh, anything anyone would like some more information on? I would, I would like to pull out and, and have uh, Travis maybe talk a little bit about 6.03 to 6.07. Um, we're in the process here of being able to, um, or just about maybe spend quite a bit of money with some updates and just kind of have a chance to kind of walk us and talk us through some things. Please. Good evening again. Thank you. Um, I'll start right at uh, 6.03. So these are the trade bids for Canyon Creek Elementary School. Um, we were fortunate enough to, we bid 32 work packages as part of, of the uh, bid package number one that came out um, and had very, very good uh, bids that came in. Uh, we averaged about five bidders per package on those. Um, so some ranged, uh, we had two of them that we had one, but we had others that were as high as eight bidders per package. So uh, we, we hit a very good spot on bidding the, the project. Um, the, the two work packages that we're recommending tonight that had only one bid, one of them was under the, the $20,000 um, um, threshold. And then the other one was uh, for our um, wood, wood flooring uh, package or our learning stairs. And that group that we're recommending was the same group that just finished the learning stairs at uh, Mill Creek and at Olathe West. So we were very, very confident that they had the uh, scope of work and, and, um, and all the, the, um, the specifications and construction documents. Uh, so we felt comfortable with theirs. Um, also want to make mention that we're uh, hopefully to start construction pending your approval here at the end of February and through uh, March or April of 2019 that will allow us allow the district to get furniture and everything in place for an August 2019 open 6.04 the trade bids for the 2018 middle school entry expansions and renovations projects this is going to happen at four facilities it'll be at Frontier Trail Indian Trail Pioneer Trail and Santa Fe Trail Middle Schools. Similar project to what we just finished up at Oregon Trail the, this past year. Um, we bid 19 work packages as part of the, part of the first um, group that came through. And we averaged uh, about three per, uh, per bid package. So once again, a, a really good uh, group of bids that, that came in. Uh, a little bit more um, um, demolition and specialty to work compared to a, a brand new build of an elementary school. Um, we're gonna start Frontier Trail, Indian Trail, and Pioneer Trail here uh, at spring break and have it finish at, at the beginning um, or at the end of summer. And we're gonna start Santa Fe Trail um, right at summer break and it should go through about maybe the, the end of October. They have a little bit more demolition work uh, that needs to take place at their facility compared to the others. So that's why we, we were able to um, push that back and have a summer start on that project as well. Then uh, 6.05 trade bids for the uh, summer 2018 roofing projects. Uh, we had nine work packages, so nine, nine facilities. This is part of our um, um, roofing program that was associated with uh, the bond issue. So we had very good bids on that as well, average three per, um, per bid package, except for, for two of them, we had only uh, uh, two bids on those, but those were our larger projects. So as you look at the economy of scale on those projects, those two were our highest ones, but we interviewed all the, the contractors and they're very, very confident they could finish the, the work uh, during the summer. Uh, once again, that's gonna be a summer con construction. We'll start right as soon as school's out. It should be able to finish by the end of summer as well. Then 6.06 .06 is the district track repairs uh, project. Uh, we have three facilities uh, this summer on, on the books. We have Oregon Trail, Olathe Northwest, and Olathe South. Uh, we were going to start those projects right as soon as track season stopped, and that should uh, flow through through the rest of summer as well. And it has a, a myriad of, of different projects that are going to take place, um, whether we're re replacing surface or just doing a new top coat or adding some, some grading. Um, it's, it's got a little bit of everything for, for all three facilities as well. 
And then the last one, 6.067, is construction management proposal for our 2018 aging facility project. Um, uh, our aging facility project this year, what we're calling number five, this is the, the fifth year of it, will take place at 26 foot schools. So it, once again, has a, a lot of different projects uh, intel for that, ranging from um, painting to new gym flooring to re replacing some, some old demountable partitions in um, and putting up new uh, solid partitions between classrooms. And this is for the construction management uh, portion of that this evening. And we are recommending going with Navholtz Construction, which is a, a local company here in Olathe. Uh, they are re regional, but they have a, their office is located in Olathe as well. So this will be the first time that we're able to, to work with them. Uh, they have um, submitted RFPs on past projects and, and we have interviewed them for other projects. So um, we were able to uh, after we got the RFPs in, meet with them and their team, and we're very confident that they could, could complete the project for us. I can field any other questions. Thank you. No problem, thank you. I would like to get a little bit more information, just a kind of quick rundown on 6.09, if we could. Yep. Uh, Certainly. Have an opportunity for that to be a future acronym. Um, on 6.09 uh, is looking at a uh, proof of concept in three of our buildings um, <coughs> later this spring for a wireless network. Um, we have struggled with our wireless network since the beginning of the school year. It uh, took a while to identify what those causal root cause of uh, those issues in our current wireless network. Um, they needed to make some um, significant changes to their base software, which helps regulate the system. Um, we thought that that would occur about November. We're now into February and still waiting. Um, it's impacted uh, our, our, our ability in, in many different ways to have the type of confidence in our network that we need. Um, and the stability for our teachers to be able to have confidence that they're going to be able to utilize the, the technology that's been provided f instructionally. Um, so we began to look at what, what might be some other options. Um, Arrowhive, which is our current network, at the time it was selected, uh, it's, a, it, it's a good product in which um, it, uh, through the, the software management component, um, doesn't take a lot of customization from the district's end. At the time we made that decision, one to one was not a conversation. And as we've moved with one to one, um, realized the, the uh, challenges at West, um, simple things from students moving from classroom to classroom, how do the wireless um, access points hand off the, those types of connections. We realized that we, we probably need some um, greater customization and, and some abilities that maybe other wireless networks would have. So we've uh, settled on what we think is, is by far the, the best um, option for us to take a look at, and that's uh, Cisco. Cisco is very much an industry standard. Our back end of our networks, our switches, all those are also Cisco. So what we want to do is take a look at these three buildings, um, west, south, uh, West was selected because that's where we have the greatest load with our one-to-one. -one. South, just because of the physical construction of that building is going to make it very challenging. So if it works there, it's going to work anywhere is kind of the assumption. And then uh, California Trail to, to get us a middle school. Um, the hope is we'll be able to make this change over spring break uh, if approved. It'll give us the rest of the school year to identify how well this option works um, and if this is a, a direction we should move forward with in the future. So it's really a, a proof of concept working with Cisco. AOS, who is a third party that we use for a, a lot of our technology support um, as partners uh, to see if this is a, is a better for solution as we continue to expand our technology footprint and device footprint moving forward. Good, thank you. I, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. So assuming that this goes really well, what does it look like going forward? Do we concentrate on our middle schools? Do we start looking at the next high school? Do we have a plan? The, the plan at this point in time, and that's, that's part of what we're still trying to put pieces together, what does that plan look like and, and how quickly and, and seeing some of the issues that, that might come about. I would assume our next target is we would move with the high schools, okay. the middle schools, 
and then took a look at, at the elementaries. When we've got as many buildings as we have, it would take a while for that transition to occur. But um, as we know, we want to move um, forward with the one-to-one -one at the high schools once we've, we've got assurances um, taken care of, those would be the you know the next phase and then middle schools um, after that so is it possible we're looking at the start of next school year for some of the for yes. some of the high schools okay yes so we're about a semester behind then we're so. about uh, about a semester behind okay. um, you know the as the board had, had asked um, for us to west was our first and we've learned some things mm -hmm. um, so once we can stabilize the, the network to a greater degree, um, we think we'll be able to move forward uh, um, more quickly with uh, the remaining high schools. Um, we're also in the process of doing some analysis around devices and trying to make sure that, you know, decisions we made um, are still valid moving forward. That's the thing about technology. We all know within a year or two, things can, can change um, very quickly, can provide us opportunities uh, that didn't exist in, in the past. So we're, we're going to look at, at all of those areas to make sure as we move forward, we are putting our best foot forward and providing what our um, students and teachers need to be successful. He's helping the board save face <laughs> right there. <laughs> well, I, I just want to, so one other question that I want to make a comment on this. So. So this new proof of concept, has it, have we gone out, has it, has it been used someplace else so to give us a reason to even look at it? It's yeah, it, it, it would be uh, um, really the industry standard. I mean, it's used uh, across school districts, businesses. Um, they're, they're, they have some abilities uh, with their access points and, and the management behind that um, that provide more scalability. Um, variance in, say, an access point on how strong its radio signal is, um, that it can adjust as necessary. If you typically have 50 in a room and now you're going to have 100, that it can, it can scale. There are just some, um, some capabilities there. Part of the proof of concept are, are two key pieces uh, that we were looking at. One is the controller. So you need that uh, to kind of connect your system and, and, and to manage all the Cisco access points, and the other is the software that, that helps do that. So part of what we're looking at here, if this is successful, it's the only time we have to have to purchase um, some of those, those pieces. So as we expand to the other buildings, part of this cost will help us uh, up, up front as we move forward. So it is a proof, proof of concept, uh, meaning we're gonna we're gonna kick the tires. We're gonna look at it very carefully. We're gonna make sure that this um, this is what we see as a long term solution for us uh, moving forward, and um, do our real due diligence on um, how we analyze this uh, before we take the next step. Well, the, only, <clears throat> the comment I want to make is because I do I see us as a very innovative district. We try lots of different things. Um, and with technology being a big part of this. One of the things that we need to, and, and we want to make the public and everybody else, sometimes sometimes you feel you have to have the permission, but if you think about being innovative and what you're trying, sometimes you have to fail, okay? And, you have to, and, and if you look at out there just in the industry and technology, they talk about failing often and failing fast. But sometimes you got to feel good about that. And sometimes we as a board need to be able to talk about that and say, you know, that's why a proof of concept is there, because we don't know if it's going to work or if it is going to work. But we also want to make sure that we are looking at this and we're giving ourselves permission to say, if we're going to fail, fail fast and let's move on to something different. The technology is still so important to us and to our students and, and to the faculty and everything else. So we're not always going to be perfect and successful every single time. And I just want to kind of bring that out and, and know and make us feel a little more comfortable of saying, yeah, sometimes we don't always get it right, but let's do it quickly. Let's fail fast. Let's fail, I don't want to say often, but that's what we do say, right? Don't want to fail often, but if we do, let's fail quickly and move on forward and try something different. So I appreciate the fact that we're doing this because we did promise the public, we promised our students we'd get the one-to-one -one out there. And, and I would rather us go back and relook at this and do it right. And to Amy's point, be a little bit off as far as the timing with this, but still be able to deliver, but deliver a good quality product going forward. I, I would agree. We've got a, um, a fantastic staff that uh, have been very involved in, in the discussions and in the planning as, as we move forward. 
Uh, there, there are probably three things anymore in education that you, you've got to have to have school. Um, electricity, copier, <laughs> and our network infrastructure. Um, <laughs> you know, both, uh, and wireless has just become um, synonymous with w what we're all used to. And we expect it to work, and we expect it to work with without an issue. Um, but there's a lot that goes behind, uh, needs to go on behind the scenes in, in those pieces put in place to make sure that ha that happens. And schools are far more complicated than a business environment when we take a look at our, our networks because of security. Um, you think of what we, we need to do to, to provide for um, our filtering system and how that has to look different, you know, for kindergartner to a fifth grader to a senior in high school to our staff it, it becomes very complex uh, and we want to make sure and as we move forward with all of our technology decisions that um, we're going to do the best we can and uh, to make sure it's right and if it's not functioning the way it needs to instructionally um, then we're we'll be back in front of you to talk about uh, what we need to do to, to make sure that we're moving forward other questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. I move to accept action item 6.01 to 6.09 as written. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Shear, second by Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Geary? Yes. Mr. Whitcliffe? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. 7.01 in action other, the sale of the North Lindenwood Service Center. Any questions or more, more information on that? Hey John, could you just kind of update us and kind of walk us through this sale? By the way, Heather did say that she'd rather keep the building and move back into that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She had made a few friends in the final days of this <laughs> building. <laughs> Rodent and reptile. <laughs> Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Mar in March, we actually um, put uh, North Linwood uh, Service Center on the market at $2.1 million. Back in 2012, we had an appraisal at about $2 million for that property. Uh, a lot's changed in the last five years. Uh, we kind of jokingly talk about this, but the reason we wanted to vacate the building is we knew it was um, falling in, into disarray, and now that it is uh, unoccupied, it's, gonna, it, it, it's not going to improve uh, in any way. We sat on the market, lowered our price to about $1,750,000, and we had two groups that kept looking at the building, um, but were not in that uh, ballpark and never really uh, made an offer. Uh, I ordered a second appraisal from a different group, um, uh, both uh, national um, appraisal companies, and it came in at $1.1 million. And one might ask what, why such a, a wide spectrum. Part of it is... The, eight, the building continues to um, uh, 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 fail, uh, honestly, HVAC systems. Uh, drainage is a huge issue on that site. Uh, so if one assessor walks through one day and it's sunny and another one comes during the rain, you're going to see the difference there that you may not uh, may not have. And it's the approach that was taken. Um, one uh, approached it that uh, the offices were a good thing. Another said, no, this is an industrial building. Those offices need to go. Uh, bottom line, today's market says it's $1.1 million. Uh, we had an offer at 1.2. Uh, after further review, uh, the um, uh, the offer was reduced to a million fifty. Uh, I know no board is going to sell a piece of property below appraised value. We were able to negotiate that to one point one and waive all future um, uh, inspections of the building. So uh, accept it as is, and that's the offer that's before you this evening. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'd entertain a motion. I move to accept 7.01 as written. Second. And quickly. <laughs> Got a motion by Mr. Shearer, second by Mr. Geary. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Geary? Yes. Mr. Wycliffe? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. And John, remind me never to have you try to sell something for me. You only bought it for 10 That's right. All right, you can see some future action items there. Um, handful of trips uh, and some equipment. Any questions? If not, uh, you had a January Head Start Director's Report as part of your written information, and we can move on to topics for discussion. 
Anything the board would like to bring up? I'd just mention that Mr. Geary and I plan to head to Washington, D.C. this weekend uh, for the NSBA Advocacy Weekend, and we'll be learning about a lot of the, uh, the issues nationwide that are impacting education and get the viewpoint of um, our national organization as, as far as how to best lobby our members of Congress. And then on Tuesday, we'll spend the day at the Capitol actually visiting with our congresspeople and senators from the state of Kansas, and hopefully having a little bit of influence on how they proceed this year with education policy. And I guess, go ahead. And yeah, I was say, I mentioned I'm going a day early to attend the equity symposium with some best practices related to um, making sure all of our kids are, are being taught and even our staff is being treated equally and hired equally and things like that. So that's tied in, so I'll be at, at that uh, tomorrow. Looking forward to continuing the drinking out of the fire hose. <laughs> and, I'm, and also, um, I think Mrs. Felter had intended to come, but I believe she's still too sick to go. So um, she wishes she was with us, but it looks like she won't. And I guess I would add to that that uh, earlier in the week, uh, Mrs. Martin, myself, Mr. Hutchison, and Mr. Allison had an opportunity to um, attend a luncheon for the Johnson County delegation in Topeka uh, and give. Uh, each of the superintendents from Johnson County were able to um, give their perspective on some of the items that the legislature is going to have to deal with uh, regarding education and, and and sort of where we stand. Um, and so that was good to be able to get in front of them and uh, give them some of our perspective. So appreciate that. Others, we'll move on to superintendent comments. Uh, got a couple items for you this evening. As you know, um, one of the, the, the key focuses um, this year has been to make sure we're uh, aggressively recruiting um, and hiring talent because the, the difference that's made for our students day in day out are the teachers in the classroom and our instructional leaders there in, in the buildings. Um, our HR department uh, has worked diligently as, as always, but been very focused in looking at those opportunities in, in a market where, um, and many of you have heard me say this in, in different conversations, I think the greatest crisis facing Kansas public education, finance of course is a major issue, but as we look on down the road is going to be about having the teachers we need and the quality teachers, more importantly, in our classrooms moving forward. And we're, we're not seeing um, our, our young folks making the choice to become educators, which is, I think, has a lot to do with the perception around education and, and all the uncertainty from the last several years. But that's, that's the most critical piece. All of us exist to support what goes on in the classrooms. Um, and our, our HR department uh, has, has worked toward that. Um, tomorrow, we will, or excuse me, Saturday, we will have um, our, our first interview um, group here at, uh, at the Ed Center. We've got over 60 candidates. So we've got uh, principals and others that are gonna help, so we'll be able to, um, interview the, those folks. We're going to do another um, event in March. There's over a dozen recruiting fairs. This is kind of the recruiting season. Um, those folks are going to put a lot of, a lot of miles and time in uh, making sure that we're looking and, and working um, as hard as we can to, to provide the very best teachers for our students. Uh, so I think that focus is critical as, as we move forward, and we're going to continue to refine that and think about how, how do we maybe do this differently, um, different era. Uh, we've got to be competitive. Um, how do we recruit millennials? I think there, there are a lot of questions, but wanted you to know that that focus continues and, and, and will continue moving forward. We will have a better idea literally in, in the next 24 hours or so. Today was the deadline for um, retirement letters uh, for staff to be eligible for the, for the early retirement program. So that always gives us our next glimpse into specific high needs and some other things we, we might need. So um, I commend the HR department for their hard work and it's just beginning, but uh, uh, we're gonna do our best to make sure we've got the, the very um, top quality teachers in the classroom. 
Uh, starting today, we had um, administrators, social workers, counselors, school psychologists beginning to look at our data from the um, social emotional learning uh, assessment. So this is the first snapshot for us and, and um, Dr. Dugan's here to, to answer questions about that. I got to sit in on, on some of that this morning. Some really incredible information that I think is, is we think about needing to educate the whole child. Uh, that social emotional learning is so critical and giving us insight into our students how they perceive themselves and, and those other components. It's just going to be phenomenal moving forward. Anything you want to add, Dr. Dugan? It's a great morning. Our staff are so excited to dig into data and we'll just let them get into it, start to discover some things, and we'll just continue that conversation. Um, counselors, social workers, school psychologists were just like salivating. <laughs> uh, it tells us a lot. It's not perfect yet. We've got work still to do, but we've got curriculum in place, and we certainly have motivated staff. Uh, Olathe is, is, I've had conversations around the state, even around around the country, has been so progressive when we take a look at the, the social workers and the partnerships and, and focusing on um, that social emotional learning component. And this is just a, an, another step forward. I think it's, it's going to give us information. As we heard in Topeka, some requests and conversations with, um, with the legislative delegation and that, you know, that empirical, well, what can you really tell us? We keep hearing from schools that this is becoming more of an issue, but you got you to gotta give us something other than a story, and this is going to allow us to do that um, and allow us to be very strategic and explicit in how we're going to approach um, embedding this along with the curricular pieces that you approved this fall and, and how we move forward. So um, very beginning of a big step, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that Olathe has done and, and really is uh, a leader in the country for some of the conversations and things we're gonna be doing. And then last, it's kind of a, an update you may remember in the fall, we talked about on uh, um, professional development days, uh, Dr. Dane and Dr. Yeager worked with YMCA to help provide daycare for our teacher's children so that that wasn't a, an issue on those days. Um, tomorrow is a PD day and we have over 125 kids signed up. So I think again, that's a benefit for our staff um, and, and a, another example of being creative and trying to, to support staff to take that, that worry and, and issue off their plate so that they can focus on the professional development that we need so they can um, continue to grow as uh, teachers in the classroom. And that concludes my comments. Great, thank you. Uh, executive session. I know we need 15 minutes uh, as a board. Do you have a sense for how long we only need? Um, uh, let's go uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes for, 30 minutes including our 15? Or? Okay. Including, Very total. Good. I move that the board go into executive session to discuss personnel pursuant to non-elected personnel exception under coma, consultation with an attorney for the body or agency related to matters in litigation pursuant to the exception for matters which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship under coma, and that the board return to the regular meeting at 7.45 p.m. in this room. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Martin and a second by Mr. Shear. Mr. Geary? Yes. Mr. Whitcliffe? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mrs. Martin? I will vote yes, but I'm not sure exactly what I just voted for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not my words. 